Clay Calloway is a Senior Environmental Health Specialist in the Environmental Related Illness Program at Maricopa County Environmental Services. Clay has worked in the ERI program since 2018 and is responsible for conducting case investigations, local and multi-state outbreak response, and traceback. When he isn't out in the field, he conducts complaint surveillance for food and waterborne illnesses in Maricopa County, teaches the county's active managerial control class, and assists in training new environmental health specialists. Thanks for being with us today, Clay. Um, whenever you are ready, you can start screen sharing and take over from here. Excellent. Thanks, Corey. Quick. How's that audio? How are those visuals coming through? Is that all right? Yeah, it looks and sounds good. Uh, very good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> you might think it's um, a little strange uh, that someone from a jurisdiction in Arizona um, is going to give you a presentation about oysters. Uh, but uh, for the last four years, um, I've been doing a lot of these investigations, um, trace back. Um, and recalls uh, for illnesses that are related to um, oyster consumption in Maricopa County. Um, and this time, uh, my time in the program, it's led me to uh, restaurants of all stripes, um, both modest ones and pretty extravagant places. Um, really, no one is safe. Um, no one's safe from the possibility of one of these illnesses that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and my goal here, uh, what I intend to do is to provide information on what I've learned um, firsthand um, out in the field. I'm going to start by giving you some background on um, oysters, um, oyster consumption, um, their association with Vibrio species, and then we're going to transition into how they can be handled um, or mishandled um, in a retail setting. Um, so before I finish today, uh, my hope is that I can kind of talk to two groups at the same time. Um, if you're someone who goes into food establishments um, and you're responsible for food safety, um, I hope that I can give you some clear instructions, um, some tips of what, uh, what I've seen um, during these investigations, things you can look for, um, things you can educate people on. Um, and for the other group, if you don't do these inspections, um, but you're just curious, um, maybe you like eating oysters, um, I hope you, I can leave you with some education on how you can safely uh, consume these. All right, uh, a quick note on what oysters are. Um, oysters are uh, bivalve mollusks, and they tend to grow in areas uh, with water that's uh, saltier than freshwater, um, but less salty than seawater. Sometimes people uh, will call these brackish waters, um, and they exist in um, a lot of different coastal areas uh, worldwide. Um, they set up uh, rock-like reefs um, at depths in shallow waters. This isn't really a deep ocean thing. Um, and they're produced domestically in the United States um, by a lot of different uh, people and in a lot of different places here. And we also get them imported in from all over the world. I've got a few countries listed down there at the bottom. I want to say that I've seen oysters from all of these sources, except maybe not Korea. Um, most of the establishments in our county, um, they're getting these oysters from a distributor. Um, so that comes on a truck and it's delivered just like anything else that you would expect um, to a kitchen. Um, I have had a few places that um, they actually get or, uh, oysters flown in um, directly. So a food employee actually goes to the airport on a daily basis and picks those up fresh. Um, you can see uh, these gentlemen in the background, they are on one of those rocky-like reefs um, and they're harvesting oysters and putting them in those, uh, those large collection bins. Um, so it looks like, um, looks like a difficult job there. Oysters, um, they're filter feeders. Um, so um, just one adult oyster can actually filter up uh, 50 gallons of water a day. Um, and to put that in perspective, uh, your typical bathtub is only gonna hold about 42 gallons of water. Um, so they're very effective. Um, but this filtering characteristic um, of oysters, um, this is where the risk is introduced. Um, so um, in the early 1600s, uh, King James I, he was quoted as saying, 
Um, he was a very valiant man who first adventured on eating oysters. They look kind of strange. Um, they grow in a strange place. Um, I don't think that the king necessarily shared the same concerns that we do um, all these years later, um, but the sentiment still rings true. Um, these, these products, these oysters, um, they're capable of concentrating a variety of pathogens um, into their tissues um, by that filtering mechanism. Um, and today I'm going to talk about um, one species of bacteria uh, specifically, um, and that's going to be Vibrio. All right, so for our Vibrio species, um, these are frequently isolated from marine environments, um, estuaries, um, and other coastal or tropical areas worldwide, um, the same kind of places that we're harvesting oysters. Um, fortunately for us humans, um, only a small subset of Vibrio species have pathogenic potential. Um, I'm gonna cover three of them today, I'll mention three. Um, and I mention these three because they make up the majority of the illness burden. These are um, Vibrio parahemolyticus, um, Vibrio cholera, and Vibrio bonificus. So strange names. Um, how many illnesses are we talking about here? Um, current estimates for both food and non-food um, illnesses from Vibrio in the U.S. each year um, break down like this. So we've got about 80,000 cases and 100 deaths. If you have one of these infections, um, the overwhelming majority of you, if you were otherwise healthy, um, you're going to have watery diarrhea, you're going to have some abdominal cramping, um, you might also experience um, additional symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, fever, uh, chills. Um, those are going to come on maybe 24 hours after you ingested that, uh, that product, so in, in our case we're talking about oysters today. Um, and you're going to live with those symptoms for about three days. Um, that's kind of your average case. Um, your average Vibrio infection. If I stopped here with what happens usually, um, we wouldn't get the full picture. Um, I wanna pick on one of these Vibrio species, um, Vibrio vulnificus, that last one that's noted there, um, because um, those infections, um, they can be significantly more serious. Um, they can lead to some pretty, uh, pretty negative health outcomes. Um, uh, Vibrio vulnificus, um, it's actually the leading cause um, of death related to seafood consumption in the United States. Um, and it has that, um, that title because it can make its way into the bloodstream and cause sepsis pretty easily. Um, for immunocompromised individuals, um, particularly those with uh, chronic liver uh, disease, they're at extreme risk. Um, and if you take a look at the literature, um, they pretty much state that if you have certain pre-medical, uh, pre-existing medical conditions, you're 80 times more likely um, than healthy people um, to get one of these Vibrio vulnificus uh, bloodstream infections. Um, so um, all in all, the mortality rate for those in the U.S. is around 34%. Um, so um, Vibrio vulnificus, it can cause sepsis, it can cause death. Um, it's something that we have to keep in mind um, when we're talking about, um, about oyster, uh, oyster consumption particularly raw oyster consumption, which I'm gonna spend the majority of time uh, talking about today. If you look through the resources from local jurisdictions, if you look through the studies, the scientific literature, um, they do a really good job of outlining all these dangers. Um, so you can make kind of an informed decision before you um, kind of jump in and eat riskier food items. Um, but I wanted to ask a question here and kind of uh, get us thinking, does the public always utilize these resources? Um, do they even utilize these resources most of the time? Um, do they consult the, the best information that's out there and make that informed decision? I would like to think that the answer is yes, um, but I know realistically, um, a lot of people, um, they form their opinions, they get their information just based off of whatever they read um, on the internet. And so what I did was, um, I decided to take a look at some of the most popular articles um, that are on, um, on the internet. I just did Google searches um, to see kind of what the attitude, what they had to say um, regarding raw oyster consumption. And the top articles um, covering raw oyster consumption, uh, they focus on uh, debunking something called the R myth. And uh, they make the case for year round, basically carefree uh, raw oyster consumption. And before we discuss 
um, the argument against the R myth. I'm going to explain to you what it is. Most, uh, most likely a lot of you have heard it already. Um, but the R myth is, um, it's a piece of advice and it says um, that it's only safe to consume raw oysters with months containing the letter R. Um, this would make September through April safe. It would make May through August unsafe. And I'm not sure exactly how long this myth has been around, a long time, I would assume. Um, and um, it really addresses uh, three major concerns that I want to talk about in some of the background that we're doing here. Um, the first concern that this myth has always addressed um, is um, harmful algal blooms. Um, so warmer summer months, they actually provide ideal conditions for these. Um, I'll abbreviate them as HABs. Uh, sometimes they're also referred to as red tides. And you can see a nice red tide in this photo here on the right. Um, but they don't always have to be red. Um, HABs, they can be a variety of colors. They can be colorless. Um, and um, they result from marine life accumulating different toxins um, that cause um, neurotoxic and amnesic shellfish poisoning. Um, so algae that produce those toxins, they grow faster and thicker because the water is mixing less um, and there's increased sunlight uh, absorption during summer months. So that's always been a concern with this. Um, and the second concern is um, spawning. Um, traditionally, um, oysters, um, they're going to reproduce when the temperature is warmer. Um, and while they're preparing for reproduction, um, the oyster itself actually goes through a variety of changes. Um, they reduce their overall size, their uh, taste, their texture is altered. Um, and these, these changes aren't really good for uh, a food quality perspective. They're not, as, they're not as good to eat. The last concern with the R myth has always been temperature. Um, this is a big one here. Obviously, if you have um, warmer waters, um, that's gonna pose a problem. Um, if you have uh, shell stock or, or even seafood that's harvested and it sits out for long periods of time, um, that's going to cause uh, problems, most notably what we're going to talk about today, Vibrio, um, Vibrio growth. So um, these are the things in the past that uh, kind of people have used the R myth and they said, okay, during the summer, we're going to kind of avoid eating oysters because these are the risks. And I was surprised when you go look on the internet now, they're, they're, they can debunk or they try to debunk all three of these things. Um, and I'll give you kind of what their, their counterpoints are here. So um, for harmful algal blooms, um, they pretty much talk about um, cutting edge uh, harvesting practices. Um, and those include uh, strict environmental monitoring, um, water quality testing, things like that. Um, so that at each stage, that product is more protective. Um, if there's high concentrations of harmful algae that's going to trigger a ban um, and customers aren't going to eat the oysters um, if they don't come from clean waters. Um, so that sounds good. That sounds like a good thing. Um, this next point that they debunk with the spawning, um, I found this really fascinating. Um, oyster farmers nowadays, they're actually using um, new breeding techniques um, and they are using in warmer areas or in warmer season they're using oysters that are sterile, um, so they don't reproduce. Um, and because of that, um, they retain their size. They don't suffer from any alterations in taste or texture. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then finally, I thought this one was a little humorous, uh, but um, they mentioned that um, food safety practices are stricter than in the past and the industry as a whole has more knowledge and awareness and proper handling of oysters. And they mentioned, Oh, everybody understands now that they have to be on ice or um, refrigerated immediately after harvest. So I kind of took all this in and um, kind of thought, okay, what do I think about this? Um, my concern was if a customer or a food handler or a permit hold, uh, holder, if they read these articles, um, they could come away um, kind of equipped with a triumphant rebuttal of the old way of thinking. And they could have a risk-free, totally risk-free outlook on eating raw oysters uh, year round. As a food safety professional, um, really our primary role is to ensure that um, people who run restaurants, people who staff them day in and day out, um, that they have effective control over foodborne illness risk factors. That's what we're doing. Um, and in order to achieve control over those, um, they're gonna have to be reminded that they exist. The risks do exist. Um, do exist. So 
Um, while some of the original reasons for this R myth may no longer apply, um, I still think that there are significant risks associated with raw oyster consumptions and eating those um, year round that need to be addressed. Um, really quickly wrapping this up, um, HABs are still a concern, um, these harmful algal blooms. Um, if you look at the literature, they anticipate that cases of shellfish poisoning are going to keep increasing. Um, that's going to be more and more of a problem um, for a variety of reasons, um, increased ocean temperatures, um, <clears throat> increased travel, um, natural environmental factors, um, all of those things. Um, and these toxins are tricky. After they've been filtered up by our, our oysters, they're going to be heat stable. Um, they're going to be undetectable by sight, by taste, by smell. Um, you could have the best oysters of your life and they could give you, um, get you sick. Um, but out of all of these, these things, um, what gives me the most concern um, is temperature. Um, the temperature control is going to be uh, really important in what we talk about today. Um, and I know, I think everyone knows there's a big difference between knowing the correct temperature and then actually making sure that your products are in temperature day in and day out. Um, every year in the county, um, we have uh, ridiculous uh, summer temperatures, um, and that leads to more cold holding violations that are written here. Um, and out at those harvesting locations, that's no exception. Um, Many oysters, just as a matter of course, they're going to contain um, detectable levels of Vibrio species. Um, fortunately, the infectious dose for us is quite large, um, but if there's, a little, if there's a little dose in there that's below that infectious dose and then things are temperature abused, it's gonna get big and big and big until it, it actually could make someone sick. Um, so um, that stress in the summer months, those high temperatures, um, each point in the farm to fork continuum or from harvest all the way until it makes its way to a customer plate, there's added stress on each one of those. So long story short, um, despite industry improvements, which are impressive, um, there is still risks associated with eating raw oysters. There's things that we need to think about here. All right. Um, we can see this when we start looking at the available data. Um, I'm going to quickly show you this. Um, the CDC has a system uh, for reporting these infections, um, and that system is called COVIS, um, not COVID, uh, COVIS. Um, it stands for Cholera and Other Vibrio Illness Surveillance. And this system, um, it collects information on the illness experienced uh, for the case, um, recent seafood consumption, exposure to bodies of water, the source of implicated seafood. Um, it collects all of that. Um, and illnesses from Vibrio are reported across the nation. Um, and this allows the CDC to kind of take a step back, um, track these infections, monitor food trends, um, and respond to uh, clusters and outbreaks. Locally, um, it's gonna play out like this. So if a Maricopa County resident is diagnosed with Vibrio species, um, they're interviewed by public health to determine possible exposures. Um, if they have seafood or shell stock, shell stock meaning oysters um, or mussels or clams, something like that in their food history, um, and the incubation time makes sense, um, we're going to be requested to go out on site and investigate, um, me and, and my coworker, Erica. Um, we'll go out on site, um, we make observations, um, we'll institute control measures there and then, um, and then we'll obtain that source information on the product consumed. Um, that source information is really important. It needs to be entered into this reporting system. Um, and when you get everyone participating and getting all of that, um, <clears throat> you can get data that looks like this. Um, you can do, do special things with it. Um, I've got limited data here today, um, <clears throat> but I do wanna go over um, a few of these. Um, so uh, COVIS shows us uh, different years of domestically acquired vibriosis cases um, in the United States. And we can see the month of illness onset um, laid out on the um, x-axis, and we can see the number of cases on the y. Um, you see the different lines moving around. I really just want you to focus on the blue line here. Um, and that blue line represents um, <clears throat> the total confirmed and probable foodborne cases um, within a given year. Um, unfortunately, I just have 2011 through 2014 to share with you. That's what I could grab. Um, but um, I still think that this is worthwhile. And let's look at uh, what's happening with these foodborne cases um, month to month. 
Um, so as we move into the months um, without an R in them, you'll notice that there's a typo on this. There's two marches that should be May actually. Um, but as we move into May and then we continue into the summer, um, we're going to accelerate. We're going to have a big rise in these, these foodborne cases. Um, they're going to go up. They're going to be at the very top. They're going to peak in the middle of August, and they're going to come back down. So those are all within months that do not have the letter R, which that myth was telling us to avoid. Let's go to the next year here. Same setup. Um, let's follow that blue line. Um, again, in May, um, things start kind of uh, getting worse, and it's going to go through June, July. Um, it's going to peak in the middle of July, and then it's going to take some time to tail off. Um, and as we go back down to those months with the letter R, we're getting into low, low numbers. Uh, this one from 2013 is a little bit blurry. Um, I don't know why it's blurry. It's blurry right off the CDC site, but um, it's not blurry enough to hide the trend um, that we're seeing. Um, as expected, uh, summer comes, cases follow. I mean, this year, look at the number of cases, over 200 um, just in that period of July. Um, so um, it's really exploding in those summer months, those months without the letter R. And then the last one, um, again, this is what we would expect at this point, massive food board spikes every summer. You might be wondering, okay, what account uh, for these total confirmed and probable food board, uh, foodborne um, cases how many of these consumed oysters? Um, I do have stats on that I can pull up at the end, but for most of those years, the majority of cases did consume oysters. And if it wasn't, it was sitting somewhere around 50%. So we're still seeing the impact of these oysters here among other seafood. Okay, quickly moving on, looking at Arizona. Um, <clears throat> starting back in 2011 again, um, you can see that there are a lot of states um, that have high numbers. And what this is showing is the number of cases of Vibrio infections by state. Um, it ex excludes a, a couple of serotypes here, but you'll notice that we're not the worst. Um, there are case, uh, states with higher case counts than ours. Um, but when we start looking at the yellow uh, states, the non-coastal states, um, Arizona is number one uh, for the most cases um, with 24. Um, and um, the next year, Back-to-back -back champs, uh, 27, the most cases out of any non-coastal state. Um, and that's for, for 2012 now. And moving into 2013, um, Minnesota relieved us of the title. Um, they had 20 that year and we had 18, but still the second most um, in a non-coastal state. And then finally for that last year, they switched the colors up on us. Um, but for non-coastal states, we were tied for first place with Minnesota. So, there's something happening in Arizona. Um, there's something that we need to be concerned about. Um, even though we're landlocked, um, we still have these cases. Um, and you can see that stat on the bottom left-hand corner there. Um, I think, I believe this is for Vibrio parahemolyticus, but um, for every one diagnosed case, um, there's 142 that go undiagnosed. So the real burden of illness is much higher than that number that you see um, put nicely inside um, the state of Arizona there. What's happening um, in Arizona? Um, I can make some hypotheses. Um, if you live here, you can probably guess what I'm about to mention, um, and that's going to be summer temperatures. Um, I took some average temperatures for Maricopa County um, just through May, June, July, August. Um, if you live here, you're gonna you're gonna know these already. But May average temperature 96, record highs at 112. Um, June, average of 105, um, max of 123. Um, July, it doesn't get much better. Average of 107, max of 121. Um, and for August, almost getting out of summer, average of 105, max of 116. Remember that these establishments, they have to keep oysters during transport, um, during storage. They have to keep these at 41 degrees or below. Um, so on the hottest days in June, our establishments needed to keep an 82 degree temperature difference between the inside of that oyster and the outside weather temperatures. That's very difficult to do. So this covers our background. Um, it helps point us to why we need to look at Arizona. We need to look at these, these food items. We need to look at the practices that surround them. Um, there are risks here. There's risks that we need to control. Um, since those oysters are filter feeders, 
Um, there's a risk that they'll concentrate up pathogens like Vibrio, which can cause severe health outcomes. All right, now we're going to cover actual lessons learned um, from investigations that I've done here in the county. Um, and as we get into these, I'm gonna show you some photos that don't look very good. Um, just like you wouldn't go into a hospital to see how healthy a population is, um, you shouldn't see these uh, situations and think um, that they represent all establishments that serve oysters. Um, in many ways, they represent exceptions or worst case scenarios. Um, but I'll start off on something easy, um, a little on the lighter end first. Um, and this first lesson has to do with documentation. Um, so proper documentation is going to be critical. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the COVID system. Um, and that surveillance system cannot do its job without feeding it the right information. Um, in, order, in order to spot these foodborne trends um, and take appropriate action, um, you need to know which oysters the case consumed. And sometimes this is easier said than done. Uh, the current model that we're going to be using for this or that we've been using for this um, is the um, interstate certified shellfish shippers list. Um, we use that to uh, confirm the identity and the source of shellfish products. Um, every commercial oyster that you eat has a corresponding tag, and that corresponding tag, it arrives at the restaurant with the product. Um, and it tells you just about everything that you want to know. Um, you can see some examples that I've provided here in this photo. Um, it's going to break down the harvest location, the harvest date, um, as well as the type and the quantity. And in addition, it's going to give you a specific certification number for each party involved. Um, so it's a string of letters and numbers um, that just tell you the exact source and what that source is doing. I'll pull these, these up here. So um, this is one of the easiest types of food to um, determine a proof source when you're out in the field. Um, I wish that every food item had something like this. Um, you can simply go type in the IS, um, ICSSL um, on Google. It'll pull up um, the FDA's website. Um, they generate a month-by-month -month list that give you, um, gives you the right uh, providers. Anyone who is on that list is going to be approved. They're good to go. They can sell uh, oysters commercially. Um, and if they're not, they're not allowed. Um, I opened up. Um, just a random section here so you can see um, that each one of these providers, they have um, their certification number broken down by state, the number itself, and the symbol um, that tells you what it's doing. <clears throat> the FDA food code, they're going to require um, operators to keep those on site for 90 days. That long um, period of retention is uh, intended for hepatitis A, but it comes in handy for Vibrio. And the establishments, they're required to keep them in chronological order and to write down the date that the last oyster from the tag was sold. Um, so if you run out of uh, a Pebble Beach batch on November 2nd, you're going to be documenting writing in Sharpie November 2nd. Um, you can see that this, this picture, they've got the last date sold on each one of those tags. Um, and this is critical. Um, this last requirement um, makes my job so much easier. Um, if records are maintained and I go out for an investigation, um, then I can easily see what oysters were in play when the customer ate there. Um, a lot of times the customer doesn't know, they don't remember what type they had, and the type, it often isn't going to show up on a receipt. So if you want to see what was around, um, that really comes down to the establishment um, uh, being good about this records retention. Um, if they don't follow these requirements, it's going to complicate the whole process. Um, it could make it extremely difficult or impossible um, to determine exactly what, um, what oysters the case consumed. Um, a lot of these places are going through high volumes of this product. Um, if that happens, if there's a breakdown, then Covis isn't going to get the necessary information that they need to monitor those trends. And you could have clusters or outbreaks that go unnoticed because that stuff is not, the right information is not being reported. Um, now, if records aren't maintained, in some cases, you can ask them, okay, how many oysters do you serve on a regular basis? Um, you could have them reach out to their um, distributors, pull invoices, try to put those pieces back together, um, but the, the quality of the information is going to go down uh, pretty significantly. So 
The tags are important. They should be stored for 90 days in order with the last date sold on each tag. Um, this helps investigators quite a bit. Uh, some field observations. So I looked at the last 15 investigations that we conducted involving Vibrio and oysters. Um, <clears throat> and 12 out of the 15 establishments we went to um, had problems with record, uh, records retention. Um, so 80%. Um, and these problems ranged from limited uh, to severe. So in other words, maybe they had all of the requirements except one. Um, they, there were a couple of tags that were out of order or um, they didn't have the last dates sold written on four or five out of uh, 30 or 40 tags. Um, ranged from that end all the way to something like you see on the right um, in this photo, or I've had places where we will show up and they won't have any tags on site whatsoever. Um, so it can range there, but 80% um, having problems with record retention. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> Like I said, you can kind of piece this stuff back together, but you're going to take the hit with the quality of information. Um, and the longer that it takes to detect these clusters or outbreaks on a national level, um, the more people are going to consume oysters that lead to negative health outcomes. Um, we've got a simple solution, uh, something that we've kind of come up with over doing many of these. Um, and I preach this to each establishment that I go into. Um, and that's get a three ring binder um, uh, with plastic sleeves. Um, you can see that on the left here. This is a great example. This is what we want to see. Um, and I just have them stock this binder uh, chronologically left to right. So I can easily pull out one of those tags. I can read the date on there and I can get a good idea of what oysters were in play. Um, what you don't want to see um, is something on the right, like I mentioned. If we're looking at things kind of in between this, all nice and neat versus uh, in any particular order shoved in a, in a hole somewhere in the, in the truck. Um, I've also seen um, some other methods that work. Um, binders where they're gluing or stapling the tags in directly on pieces of paper, that's good. Um, I've also seen um, <clears throat> some of those desk uh, spears or those desk spikes where you can spear the tags in chronological order. So as long as you're meeting those requirements, even if they don't want to use the binder method, um, that's fine. Um, they just got to get that done somehow. Um, I'll show you here. I'll let this come up on the screen. Um, this is what you don't want to see. Uh, this is uh, from an investigation. Um, and you can see uh, this is a shot from inside of a walk-in refrigerator. Um, and down here at the bottom, this is a rogue shell stock tag down on the floor. Um, so this thing's been long forgotten. Um, it's got a little pepper on top of it. Um, and if you look closely on the left here, you'll see a roach uh, that's seen, seen better days. Um, this is not a good sign. Um, and it just so happens um, both of these um, photos are from inspections, the center photo and this one on the right. Um, these establishments were suspended um, during that investigation due to what we're going to talk about next, um, which has to do with temperatures. Um, so in summary here, proper documentation is critical. Um, the, um, the requirements are very straightforward. It's just a matter of them ex executing that on a day, uh, day in, day out basis. Um, next big point here um, is um, oysters are a delicate food item, um, more delicate than a lot of people think actually. Um, and unlike most food items that are in our permitted kitchens, um, oysters are alive um, when they are kind of in the shell oysters, like I'm gonna show you some photos of. Um, it's good to remember that um, in order for them to keep those raw oysters safe, they really need to be kept alive until they're shocked and served. Um, I've got a photo up coming here. Um, this is what you like to see. Um, you can see that these oysters are in clean condition um, and they're all closed. Um, so we don't have any open oysters. Um, <clears throat> live oysters are going to be closed. Um, this is what you want to see. Um, now, in this next photo here, um, I've, I've highlighted, I've circled this one. Um, there's a lot of daylight between that shell. Um, this one is clearly open. Um, and if you have enough room to insert a probe thermometer in there um, without having somebody shuck that for you, that's probably a bad sign. Um, now, sometimes these will be open and when you start to handle them or you tap on them, they will close, that's fine. Um, but the oysters that I've shown you here that are open, it didn't matter what you did to these, they were not closing back um, because they were dead. Um, so um, this is something that they should be the manager, the person in charge, the people who are at these stations, they should be calling these oysters on a regular basis. They shouldn't get to, to a place like this. 
Um, and they're not going to do that unless they realize how delicate these are, how special we have to treat these among other food items in the kitchen. Now, briefly, I'm going to touch on cooking here. Um, we do get an extra layer of protection um, when um, these items are cooked. Um, when oysters are cooked to the proper temperature of 145, um, Vibrio species are easily eliminated. Uh, they do not put up with the heat to kill stuff very well. Um, but for raw oysters that are going to be consumed raw, um, all of those destruction methods we typically would use, um, we're not applying them. And contrary to popular belief, um, marinating it in um, different juices or putting hot sauce on there, that's not going to um, destroy, it's not going to inactivate these, these Vibrio. So oysters consumed in raw form, um, they're going to be alive one minute, they're going to be um, eaten the next. And the only time and temperature relationship that we have to keep those items safe is cold holding. So cold holding is going to be huge here. <clears throat> Uh, strict cold holding at 41 or below is necessary as Vibrio species. Um, they've been found to grow at temperatures as low as 46 degrees. Uh, this shot is from an investigation, um, and you can see that the internal temperature of that oyster is around 49. Um, they were, that day, they were around 49 to 50. Um, we didn't need to shuck this one. There was a gap in between the shell that wasn't closing. I mean, it was already dead. Um, and you'll also notice I've got another picture coming up here. Here it is. Um, this is from the same walk-in refrigerator, and I've got a min-max thermometer in there, and it shows 49.5, or 49.4, rather. Um, <clears throat> these, these oysters are very dependent on the air temperatures. Um, there's not a lot of contact um, between them and their container. As you can see with those shrimp there um, that are below, they're still out of temp, but look at all the contact that they have with the metal pan. Um, that's going to help with heat transfer. Um, when you have the oysters, they're in the shells. The shells are only partly touching each other. They might be in a metal pan. They're probably in a cardboard box. Um, so whatever your air temperature is, um, pretty soon that's what that's going to be the temperature of your oysters. Um, and matters get a lot worse at room temperatures. You can see that stat on the bottom there. Um, Vibrio perihemolyticus can actually double every eight to nine minutes at ambient temperatures. And when they mean ambient, they mean if you just left them out on the counter. Um, and again, there's no kill step to correct this. Whatever is inside the oyster, it's going to be passed on to the consumer. Um, looking back at, at 15 investigations again, um, <clears throat> conducted in the county involving Vibrio and oysters, um, six out of the 15 establishments that I visited. Um, they had problems with temperature abuse. Um, and this isn't me taking a temperature of lettuce at one end of the facility and saying, oh, they had problems with temperature abuse. Um, if it's six out of the 15, each one of those six, um, they had oysters themselves with internal temperatures above 41. Um, and like I mentioned, two of those investigations, they ended up with a permit suspension um, due to lack of refrigeration. So again, oysters are a delicate food item. And I want to touch on a couple of more points here that kind of drive that home. Um, <clears throat> talking about storage, um, what's the best practice for storage? Um, how should establishments approach that? Um, it's going to be dependent on the volume of oysters that they have on site. Um, if, like you see in this first photo here, it would not be practical for me as an inspector to tell the establishment, hey, I sell your oysters. Um, they're not going to do that. Um, even though icing down all of your oysters is best practice, um, they just have too many. Uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I did a little estimate. So um, you're looking at nine across, about eight high. Um, this is about 7,000 oysters that they have in a walk-in here. And instead of icing, um, they could still do something very simple. Um, a piece of paper, a pen, a thermometer, and 15 minutes of their time on a daily basis could offer them a high level of protection. Um, and I'm talking about cold holding logs. Um, <clears throat> even though it's not required, um, when we go out for one of these visits, we always recommend that they institute something like that um, because uh, this shouldn't be a big sell. I mean, um, the average price of a hundred count box of oysters, it's gonna hit around, it's about 200 bucks. Um, so in this photo, you're looking at about $15,000 worth of product. And if you have a walk-in that goes down, maybe it doesn't go completely down, maybe it hits around 50 or 60, 
Um, they're going to have to toss all of these. Um, they're going to have to fix the walk-in on top of that. And then they're going to have to restock with $15,000 more worth of oysters. So um, five minutes a day, three, um, five minutes, three times a day. Um, that's not a lot to ask for this. Um, and um, they could simply do those walk, um, those walk-in checks and they could document those, like I said, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and a final time in the evening. Um, if our establishments that were involved in investigations, if they carried out a daily process like that, they would have caught the climbing temperatures themselves, um, they would have discarded temperature abuse product, and they would have been able to significantly reduce the risk um, to their customers, but also to their business, um, because that's a, a pretty big risk. Um, for establishments with a smaller number of oysters, um, <clears throat> you can ice them. Um, it, ice makes a lot more sense. Um, inside of a walk-in with ice on top, this is really the best protection. Uh, so if your establishment can, uh, if they have the capacity to apply ice, I think that they really should. Um, the next point you see here, kind of moving on from storage into washing. Um, I don't have a photo for this. This is a hard one to see, uh, to take a photo. Um, but um, washing is something that might be going on in your kitchens. Um, the washing of those oysters. They're not the most attractive looking menu item, if I can say that. And uh, sometimes establishments, they'll decide to wash them to get some of those, uh, that dirt, that debris off the outer shell. Um, let's talk about the bad way to do that first. Um, I've seen this before. Um, <clears throat> I've seen establishments, what they'll do is they'll take a cardboard box of oysters, a hundred count box, they'll put it in the bottom of a prep sink, and then they'll turn the water on and they'll leave that there for maybe 20 minutes or so um, to, to wash it. During the summer, doesn't matter if it's on cold, um, even on cold, the water is going to be coming out at around 80 degrees. We mentioned how sensitive these things are. Um, if those oysters are exposed to that water for a long enough period of time, you're going to see a huge temperature shift. Um, and if they're placed into a unit without ice, um, they're going to end up sitting in the danger zone, sitting in the danger zone uh, for long periods of time. Uh, I've even taken temperatures of product um, on ice that were washed that way hours before and they still had temperatures above 41 degrees. Um, so if they wanna wash their oysters, um, I can share a recent example that I saw um, that's a better process. Um, and that would be waiting until the oysters are going to be shucked or taken apart and um, briefly dipping them inside of a, um, a bucket that has ice and water. Um, and then they dip them, they put them on a plate and they're served. That bucket of ice water is switched out for each little batch. So it, it doesn't sit there for more than 10 minutes. Um, and the oysters themselves aren't staying in the kitchen after you've applied water to them. They're shucked, um, dipped, plated, and served. So that's, if somebody asks you, hey, I wanna wash these, like how should I do that? I would steer them away from the first example that I gave and more towards the second one. Um, although they should be inspecting those oysters for quality when they come in. And if there's too much dirt, there's too much debris, they should just say, no, I'm not accepting these. Uh, last sub point on this slide, uh, manager knowledge. Um, we know that oysters are a delicate food item, but does the manager? Um, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, you'd be surprised how little some managers knew about the products that they serve um, when we went in for these investigations. Um, and gauging that manager's knowledge is really critical in determining how much control uh, they have over risk. Um, do they know that an open oyster is often a dead oyster? Um, do they know what temperature for cold holding is? That's pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> are they familiar with their own processes even? Um, I think that there's, there's little excuse for a manager not to know uh, that the cold holding temperature is 41. Um, but a lot of managers, they actually come in from different concepts, um, concepts that uh, never served oysters. So when they come into a new place, that's not something they're familiar with. Um, and I've talked to managers that um, they don't know very much about oysters. They don't personally handle them. Um, they only they let one or two staff members who have been at the place a long time or before them uh, take care of them and they leave the whole process alone. Well, if those two people that you kind of delegate that to are good at their jobs, if they're good at food safety, then no problem. Um, but if you're a manager who delegates that to people who are doing things incorrectly, it's opening yourself up to a lot of risk. Um, so um, managers... Um, they need to be equipped with knowledge to make those, those good decisions um, in food safety. Um, that can't, can't be overstated. Um, 
And people regularly ask me uh, what places they should eat at and which ones to avoid. Um, and my answer is always, it depends on who's working. Um, the food safety inside a kitchen, it could be great on the morning shift with a certain supervisor, and then it could be much worse on a later shift with a different one. So people are a very important factor. And if they're going to kind of preside over this delicate food item, you want to make sure that they know um, they know how to handle them. Oh boy, uh, this third point, <clears throat> this one touches on food contact surfaces. Um, food contact surfaces matter. They are very important. Um, in many ways, they can make or break food safety in a kitchen. Um, and when we think about the path that oysters take inside of a kitchen, um, it really is simple. Um, if you're an inspector, you're probably familiar with this process, but if you just enjoy eating oysters and you kind of want to know what happens before it makes its way to your table, um, I'll quickly go through that. Um, as I mentioned, um, oysters are typically delivered in a big 100 count cardboard box. That box is going to be taken to the walk in refrigerator. And at this point, if your establishment's a little proactive, they might open up the box, place the oysters in a container that has holes in it, um, put another container underneath, um, and then they'll apply ice to the product. So when the ice slowly melts inside the walk in, um, they're not going to be sitting in a collection of water. So they could do that, or they might just stick the whole cardboard box in there. Um, <clears throat> those pans, those containers, they're going to stay inside the walk-in refrigerator until it's time to be shucked, or they're going to move to a reach-in for easy access so the employees can just take those out and um, shuck them up quickly. Hopefully the oysters aren't being held out for long periods of time with washing, um, but it's something that you should account for. Um, okay, it's time to shuck the oysters. Um, those are going to be brought out, and I've been in many, many, many establishments, and it's always one of two things here. So they're either um, hand shucking um, or they're using a machine. Um, hand shucking would, it's just like it sounds, um, they would take the oyster, um, they would insert a shucking knife or a shucking blade um, inside that oyster, they would turn it to pry open the shell, um, they'd pop that open, and then they would, they would plate that. Um, or there's a machine. Um, I've got a photo of the machine. Um, Keep in mind this machine that I'm going to show you costs like $600 to $1,000, um, but it's pretty much a wedge and you pull a lever and the wedge um, will go down onto a cutting board surface. Um, you place the oyster seam side up, um, the wedge is depressed, it opens up the shell um, either by hand or by this machine, those, those oysters are shucked and they're served. That's the whole process. Um, so it's very, it's very straightforward. But in each one of those steps that I described, we have a food contact surface involved. Um, a pan, a prep sink, shucking blades, shucking machines, cutting boards, containers. Um, some of the questions that we should be asking um, <clears throat> for food contact surfaces, what's the cleaning frequency? Um, how often are they being washed, for instance, sanitized? Um, are they in good repair? Is the equipment commercial? Um, does it have gaps, uh, cracks, um, chips that render the food contact surface impossible to clean. These are all excellent questions to ask and get answers to. Um, the problems in these areas, they're going to result in contaminated equipment, and that can just transfer bacteria onto fresh product, and then the customer is going to get that. This photo is obviously not something that you want to see. The container, um, the area that the container is stored in, the racks right above the food items, um, those don't look clean to anyone. Um, they don't even look cleanable to me. Um, a lot of this, this stuff here, it should have been thrown away long ago. Um, now, this specific photo, these oysters were temped at 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they had been that way for some time, um, and um, they were all embargoed. Um, and the employees on the truck, they actually did not know how to set up the sink for cleaning food contact surfaces, um, which in the end didn't matter because they didn't have sanitizer. They also didn't have test strips. Um, so uh, the picture that represents this investigation, um, they, were, they were suspended. Um, so that was corrected. Um, I got a good photo here. It shows um, an area that um, kind of represents the hand shucking method. Um, this is accomplished, like I said, holding the oyster, putting that blade in there, twisting it, getting that open. A um, couple things to note here quickly. Um, they should be NSF commercial standard. A lot of times these are given out as swag or as gifts alongside product, but they're cheap wood ones that have a lot of cracks, chips, crevices, things like that. Um, you should make sure that these are non, or make sure that they're NSF uh, blades and that they're being cleaned um, appropriately. Um, 
excellent question to always ask is how often are these blades being cleaned or how often is this surface being cleaned? Um, I ask that question on every investigation and usually someone will tell me, oh, we run a wiping cloth against this maybe every hour. Um, but that's, that's not being cleaned. Being cleaned is gonna be washed, rinsed and sanitized. And for all those surfaces that handle these delicate food items, these things that need to be refrigerated, um, if they're out at ambient temperature, these surfaces, it's gotta be cleaned every four hours. And very few managers knew this rule. I was telling them something that they said they'd never heard before. Um, <clears throat> And even fewer were actually executing it. If they did know the rule, um, they weren't actually putting a system in place to make sure that it happened. Um, you don't wanna go through all this work, um, all this effort to keep the oysters safe just to have them contaminated by a dirty blade. This is a great photo here. Um, the same is gonna to apply to shucker machines. This is what one of these machines look like, uh, looks like. This one's particularly dirty. Um, take a look at that cutting board surface. Um, a level of discoloration, there's chips out of it, um, there's food debris, there's organic matter tucked into those depressed round areas. Um, a shucking machine like this typically has a rubber puck that is removable. It would fit in that circular hole there. And it can kind of grip the oyster when you put it down. And you can, you can shuck some oysters and then you can easily just throw that in the dishwasher or three compartment sink. Um, for this stop, they quit using that, that rubber uh, puck a long time ago. And as you can see, they were just directly using that cutting surface. Um, so this is an unsafe cutting surface. Um, this is not easily cleanable. Um, it obviously has um, food debris buildup from many previous uses. Um, the next shot um, is a different shucker. This one looks a little bit better on first glance, um, but when we get closer, we can kind of see a problem here. Um, this establishment, they didn't want the, the puck to be removed, so they put a bunch of Phillips head screws through it. Um, and uh, that permanently affixed the rubber puck to this shucking board. It makes it impossible to remove, but water, um, bacteria, they're gonna get underneath there in that space between. And actually when you apply pressure to this, the water is gonna be pushed out um, along those screws and along the outside of that. So the, you're, you're incubating Vibrio at this point. And remember at ambient temperatures, that's multiplying every eight to nine minutes. Um, so you can see the last 15 investigations here, um, 11 out of 15 establishments had problems with contamination. So 73%. Um, <clears throat> quickly, I wanna talk about co-mingling because I know I'm running out of time here. Um, the code defines co-mingling as the act of combining shell stock harvested on different days. Um, or from different growing areas as identified on the tag. So if you have different shell stock that are combined into the same container, that's a problem. Um, when we go back to the beginning of this process, we're talking about COBIS, um, this can complicate that. If you have a couple of bad oysters that are mixed in with some good ones, we can spread that contamination, or people might be eating oysters that they didn't know, they thought they were one type when they were another. Um, this photo is from a investigation where we saw a lot of uh, Pretty bad examples of co-mingling. The most egregious one, um, it was a pan that had eight different tags uh, from four different harvest locations, all in the same pan. Um, and they had dates ranging from June all the way to August. Um, so what happened was the establishment would keep a pan on the walk-in for months. They would continually restock the pan. They just put new oysters in, new oysters in, new oysters in. And this makes first in, uh, first out impossible. Um, the pans end up collecting old debris. You can see that here. This is about two months worth of debris. Um, they obviously this was emptied out. This is unacceptable. Um, so <clears throat> it's just another example of contamination involving food contact surfaces. And this is important. Um, wrapping up here, I've got five minutes left. This will turn out to be right, uh, right at the end. All of these examples that I've found, um, I've seen these multiple times at this point. This is kind of the worst case scenarios, they have these types of things in common. These are good things to look for. Um, and they all have food code violations directly tied to them. So if you're responsible for food safety, um, you can put all these into practice. You can evaluate each step of this process by following a food flow. Um, my hope is that these examples, um, they gave you something of a roadmap to, so you can quickly evaluate uh, restaurants that serve these products um, from delivery to storage, to prep, finally to service. Um, we're controlling for two things, um, and that's proliferation and contamination. 
um, proliferation. We're controlling that by ensuring that they keep these under strict temperature control, 41 or below. Um, and then contamination, we're controlling for that by ensuring that they're received from the right place, trusted, verifiable vendors. Um, but the food contact surfaces are being cleaned frequently. They're in good condition. Um, they're not being spread around from batch to batch. They're not co-mingling in a pan. Um, remember for this survival that you see that's crossed out, we have no control over survival when it comes to uh, oysters that will be consumed raw. Um, if Vibrio are in the oyster, they're going to be passed on to the consumer. Um, wrapping up here, um, some final thoughts uh, for the two groups of people that I mentioned. Um, those of you that enjoy oysters and the professionals who inspect places with them. Um, for uh, just people who like eating oysters first, um, <clears throat> raw oyster consumption, it has inherent risks. Um, that's why a restaurant has to have a consumer advisory um, and it informs you of that increased risk of foodborne illness. Um, even if an establishment does everything right, they can still get a bad oyster from further back in the chain and you could get sick. And that consumer advisory, it doesn't give the establishment a license to do whatever it wants. They still have to follow the rest of the oyster rules, um, temperature, um, limiting cross-contamination, all of those things that I mentioned here. Um, in short, for any place, risks can be mitigated or they can be reduced um, by having a good food safety system with confident, um, dedicated staff, or risks uh, can be amplified um, through ignorance or mistakes or lack of effort. Um, for those of you that are not inspectors, there's a lot of jurisdictions, including ours, that make inspection reports available to the public. Um, so for any permitted establishment, you can simply visit the website. Um, you can search by address. You can read the last five inspection reports. You'll see them full text. Violations, everything. Um, that can help you make an informed decision about um, where you want to eat. Um, and for food safety professionals, in the grand scheme of things, um, raw oysters have an easy food flow. Um, HACCP would designate raw oysters as process one, um, meaning um, they are prepared with no cook steps. Um, there's no trips through the danger zone, um, no complex practices. Um, it's just prep and serve. If you're at a place that serves raw oysters, um, even if they're not receiving or shucking while you're on site, make a short trip through this process with the manager. Start at the walk-in, proceed through preparation, um, and end with documentation. Um, determine if they know the answers to the questions that you have. Um, and if you find knowledge gaps um, or process problems, um, educate them, correct them. Um, we personally can't remove all risks, um, but we can hammer home proper documentation, um, safe temperature, um, clean food contact surfaces, and hopefully limit the number of Vibrio cases that we have to go out for. Um, I don't want to forget the R myth, um, that myth that tells you you should avoid oysters in the months without the letter R. Um, I looked at um, each one of the investigations, last 15 that, that we've done, um, and 13 out of 15 occurred in a month without the letter R. Um, and I used the meal dates for that. So um, that's 87% of those cases were in those summer months. Um, and you can have a high level of safety, uh, high level of food safety year round, um, but it's not around, uh, not without its challenges. Um, so take that for what you will. Um, it seems to me um, that myths um, may still have something important to teach us um, even in 2022. So um, as far as thank yous go, um, really quickly, I just wanted to thank all of the environmental health specialists who are out there doing inspections regularly, um, who are doing follow-up visits after I visit a place like this and continue this fight um, of food safety. Um, and I also want to thank um, Maricopa County Department of Public Health, um, who assigns us these investigations, who does all of that epi work. And then finally, um, Arizona Department of Health Services um, for all of the back and forths on recalls, on tracebacks, um, and uh, for the opportunity of me uh, speaking to you all today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Clay. Your talks on this stuff always remind me why I do not like oysters. We do have like a minute or two for questions if there's any. So I'll read one here. Um, in your experience investigating local outbreaks or restaurants more often implicated than say grocery stores or vice versa. Um, I've done investigations at both um, and 
I think that a restaurant is usually more likely because people are often, I think the people that eat oysters, a lot of them get them directly from restaurants. They go there and they eat. It's kind of an experience. Um, but also for some of these restaurants that are a little more uh, fancy, um, we need to think about reporting. If you spend $600 on a meal and you end up getting sick, that, that's going to be reported to public health. Um, so I have, we have several of those situations. So um, I'd say more often restaurants, um, but I'm not always. Um, last question or, or another question coming in there. Um, do you prevent further sale of oysters um, if tags are not documented properly? Um, if you don't have a tag that can confirm the source of an oyster, then it should be on uh, embargo. So for any product that's on site, um, there needs to be a source. Uh, they need to be able to demonstrate a source. Um, <clears throat> so that can happen. Um, but preventing the further sale of oysters if the tags are not documented properly, um, usually they would be put back on the right path as far as, okay, this is the process that they're going to go um, here on out. Um, and for the oysters that they still have on site, those tags are still going to be with them most of the time. So the ones that you go there, if you're there on the actual day, they're still going to have the tags for those, thankfully. Um, another question here, aside from written violations of FDA food code, are there legal ramifications for restaurants that fail to keep proper um, documentation? Um, so outside of written violations of the FDA food code, um, I'm not aware of any other uh, regulatory code that would, that would um, kind of punish the establishment. Um, would say that a lot of foodborne illness stuff gets solved in civil court. Um, so um, that can be kind of the other, the other situation that goes on. Um, and the next one here, having eaten a lot of oysters in Mexico from various estuaries, I worry about the temperatures from harvest to supplier. Um, how is that monitored or is it? Um, it is monitored. Um, very much so. Um, the um, Interstate Certified Shellfish Shippers List and the um, NSSP, the National Shellfish Sanitation Program, um, you can read um, a lot of information about what they do. Um, and they actually do um, put in significant effort to make sure that each one of these points in the farm to fork continuum um, is taken care of um, and that those, those oysters, especially ones from the Gulf, um, are being put on ice uh, quickly. So. Awesome, thank you again, Clay.